CD formats. There's different kinds of CD formats. Let's start with Redbook. Redbook is a pre-recorded CD audio standard that you can find in music stores today. Because of this standard, any audio CD will play in any audio compact disc player. And this has been a major factor in the growth of the CD industry. Specified are the sample rate, 44.1K kilohertz. Bit depths, 16. Type of error detection and correction, and how the data is stored on the CD, among other things. Also defined is a way to add graphics information to the CD for a CD plus G, CD plus graphics disc, which was weakly tried by the major record labels in the mid 1980s and is not generally available today. Approximately 6 MB of graphic data can be stored on a disc. Each red book disc can have up to 99 audio tracks and be 74, 33 minutes in length. Among it's possible to reach 80 minutes under special circumstances. Orange Book. The Orange Book defines the standard of writable or recordable media such as CDRs and magnetic optical MO discs. It defines where the data can be written and in the case of the MO, how it is erased and rewritten. Blue Book Disc. This is a hybrid disc that is part red book and part yellow book. A blue book CD is also sometimes referred to as a CD plus or a CD extra. An offshoot of the blue book CD extra disc is an enhanced CD. The difference is in order of which the files are written which is data first, the yellow book information, then audio in the CD extra. Green Book. A precursor of the DVD in terms of flexibility, the Compact Disc Interactive CDI standard was released by Philips in 1987 and allowed for full motion video on a standard 5-inch disc. Now deficient, it requires a dedicated CDI player and is not compatible with the standard audio CD player. Yellow Book. This is a CD-ROM standard for computer data. It also adds two additional track types that differ from the Red Book audio disc. Mode 1, which is usually computer data, and Mode 2, which is usually compressed audio data or video picture data. White Book. Sometimes known as the karaoke CD, White book CDs are used in applications where the combination of limited full motion video and audio is needed. These were originally called video CDs, but soon renamed due to their more widespread use in karaoke applications. White book CDs utilize MPEG-1 and 2 compression schemes in order to compress audio and video down to a usable size. The format was originally written by Philips in conjunction with the Japanese Victor Company, JVC, and is also supported by Sony. Photo CD. Developed by Eastman Kodak and Philips, Photo CD is a way of cataloging photographs on a CD. The photos can be read in a number of ways from dedicated Photo CD players, CDI players, now obsolete. Computers with a photo CD driver set and 3DO players. Ten recording tips to remember before mastering, whether you're doing the mastering yourself or sending it to a mastering engineer. If you're sending it to a mastering engineer, don't over EQ when mixing. Better to have a bit dull and let your mastering engineer brighten things up. In general, mastering engineers have an easier time and can do a better job if the master is on the dull side rather than on the bright side. Don't compress your mix too much. If you over compress the whole mix, you'll rob the mastering engineer of the valuable tool. He might be able to reverse the effects of equalization in the mix 
but there is no way for him to recover lost dynamics. A good rule of thumb for compression is, if you can hear it, then it's too much. Don't trim your mixes beforehand. There is no way for the mastering engineer to recover lost material if you clip an intro or make a bad fade at the outro. You're potentially making a lot more work that will ultimately cost you money. It's best to leave all count offs and all tails alone and let the mastering engineer trim them. Make sure you print tones. For analog tape, this should be done before mix down on the same machine that you mix or rather than after the fact. Don't fudge these tones either. The mastering engineer shouldn't care less if you had a perfect alignment or were to be down on the left channel. All he wants to do is set up his playback machine to be a mirror image of your recorder so it plays back exactly the same. You must print 30 seconds or so of 1 kilohertz for channel balance, 10 kilohertz for zenith adjust, and 50 hertz for low frequency compensation. The last frequency is a particularly important. The oscillator of many older consoles can only output 100 hertz, but this is usually way higher than the head bump of the recorder. And any small adjustment at this frequency will mean a huge adjustment in the head bump area. 50 hertz will provide a far more accurate alignment. Check your phase when mixing. It can be a real shot when you get to the mastering studio and the engineer begins to check for mono compatibility and the lead singer disappears. Even though this was more of a problem in the days of vinyl and AM radio, mono is still important since many so-called stereo sources such as television are either PS do stereo are only stereo some of the time. Check it and fix it if necessary before you get to mastering. Be careful when using Dolby noise reduction. Dolby A, B, C, S, or S, R can be a godsend or it can be trouble if you're not careful. Don't double encode if you can help it. For instance, don't use Dolby for multi-track recording, then for mixing as well. This can cause some very distinctive phase anomalies that you will hear emphasized in the mastering studio. If you must mix with Dolby, it helps if you bring the original Dolby encoders with you since there are subtle collaboration changes that are hard to duplicate from unit to unit. New topic. I want to talk a little bit about surround mix and the features and the benefits of surround sound mixing. Here are several surprising features that are typical surround mix will have as opposed to a stereo mix. Clarity of instruments. Everything sounds much more distant as a result of having more places to set space-wise in the mix. This means that the mixer spends a lot less time EQing trying to get each instrument heard. Added dimension. Even mono tracks are big and dimensional in surround. No longer is there a need to stereoize a track by adding an effect. Simply spreading a mono source across the speakers with the pan pots makes it sound big. Abiance. When you mix in stereo, you usually must recreate depth by using effects. In surround, the depth is built in. Because of the naturally increased clarity and dimension, the mixer no longer has to spend as much time trying to artificially add space with reverb, delays, etc. This is not to say that these effects won't be used at all, but the approach is different since surround automatically has a sense of depth that must be created artificially with stereo. Mixes go faster. It actually takes less time to do a mix because surround sound 
automatically has the depth of field that you normally have to work hard to create when you're mixing in stereo. Most mixers find they need less EQ and fewer effects because there's more room in the surroundscape to place things. Being your own mastering engineer, it's good to know the fundamentals of being a mastering engineer like feather EQing and so on. But another thing you want to do is develop your ear. So with a pair of headphones on, you can listen to music through your mixing board and you can try different EQ settings. By doing this, you'll train your ear to hear different frequencies and by time you'll get accustomed to different sounds at different frequencies. Musicians seek mastering engineers that have a good ear. So if you can combine the two, and you can find musicians that know that you have both of these um, traits, um, you will probably be seeked out as a mastering engineer. This brings this podcast to a conclusion. I hope the information will be helpful for you. Happy recording. Bye for now. This is Donald Reed. Thanks for listening.